Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Jessica Dudley, Program Officer at the Joyce Foundation, and really excited to have you all in the room tonight for our panel. Um, our session, Using Social Media to Predict Gun Violence, will introduce you to a public-facing resource that will provide members of the public with real-time, targeted information on gun violence, gun ownership, and reactions to these issues in states. We will discuss both the technology behind this resource, as well as the need for such resources to support our understanding of gun violence in the United States. Joining me tonight is the co-founder of a blog dedicated to promoting the best available research on gun violence, and two of the members of the team that created this resource. I'll start with Evan. So Evan DeFilippis is the co-founder of Armed with Reason, a website dedicated to providing a scientific defense of gun violence prevention. His work on gun violence has been featured in the Washington Post, Atlantic, Slate, Vice, and many others. John Bronstein is the Chief Innovation Officer for Boston Children's Hospital. A trained epidemiologist, John has been at the forefront of the development and application of digital health tools, including healthmap.org, an internet-based global infectious disease intelligence system. Ben Reese is the Director of Predictive Medicine Group at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on understanding the fundamental patterns of human disease and developing novel approaches for predicting disease. He has created systems that allow doctors to predict dangerous clinical conditions years in advance, including suicide and domestic violence. And again, I'm Jessica Dudley, Program Officer for Gun Violence Prevention at the Joyce Foundation. The Joyce Foundation invests in solutions to pressing economic and social challenges that affect the quality of lives and vitality of our communities. Um, and we believe in creating fairness in society. We focus on the Great Lakes region and have a national impact. We believe that research and data are critical to informing policy and practice around gun violence prevention, and we have funded research and data collections in this area for the past 20 years. Gun laws in the United States allow for the easy access to an unlimited number and almost any type of firearms by virtually anyone. As a result, convicted felons, people with mental illness, domestic abusers can and do obtain lethal weapons with ease. A growing body of research has demonstrated that strong gun laws correspond with lower rates of gun deaths and injury. With this in mind, the Joyce Foundation supports efforts to build awareness about the problem of gun violence in America and educate policymakers and the media about common sense policies that improve public health and safety. I'd like to begin by providing you with some background on the toll of gun violence in America to clarify why this project is needed. Um, Evan will then discuss the current challenges to collecting and using firearms data, followed by John and Ben, who will describe the project and the ability of non-traditional data sources, such as online news, Google, and Twitter, to track a wide range of public health phenomenon before we open it up to your questions. We'd like to start by showing this brief video, which we'd like to thank Vox for letting us use to understand the state of gun violence in the United States. We need rescue inside the auditorium, multiple victims. The United States has a problem with gun violence. We hold the victims in our hearts. Perhaps we may never fully understand it. We talk about it after mass shootings, but it's much larger and more complicated than those debates allow. Here's what you need to know about the state of gun violence in America. It's true that the U.S. sees many more mass shootings than these other developed countries. Between 2000 and 2014, there were 133 mass shootings in public populated places. That's excluding gang violence and terrorism. Of course, the U.S. is a much larger country, but if you adjust for population size, it still ranks higher. Of these countries, Finland is next, with just two shootings over 14 years, but a much, much smaller population. And this type of tragedy seems to be happening more often in the U.S. Each of these squares represents a public mass shooting with four or more fatalities. Before 2011, they happened six months apart on average. But since then, only two months go by between them. I hope and pray that I don't have to come out again during my tenure as president to offer my condolences to families in these circumstances. That was October 1st, 2015. And just about two months later... Yesterday, a tragedy of San Bernardino. Uh, our first order of business is to send our thoughts and prayers to the families of those who were killed. Public mass shootings get all the attention because they're often so indiscriminate. But the truth is, mass shootings are unlike most gun deaths in America. Here's how it breaks down. 
According to the most recent data, 92 people are killed with guns every day on average. About 30 of those are homicides, of which maybe one and a half at most can be considered part of mass shootings. Most of those killed, 58 people a day, are suicides. The rest are accidental shootings, police actions, and undetermined incidents. Those suicides, they show up in international comparisons too. These are the 10 countries ranked highest on human development by the UN. The US has the highest suicide rate among them, and this darker bar shows how many of those are with guns. Some people think suicide isn't really relevant to the gun issue. But to go and think that some type of gun control regulations that are being talked about are gonna stop somebody from committing suicide when there's so many other ways for people to commit suicide. But the methods that people use are important because suicide attempts often stem from temporary crises. The vast majority of people who survive suicide attempts don't end up dying from suicide, but guns make it nearly impossible to get that second chance. The victims of gun suicides are overwhelmingly men and mostly white. And the rate of gun suicides has been increasing in the US. At the same time, the rate of gun homicides has been decreasing, especially since the 90s when crime rates in general were higher. But if you compare the US to other developed countries, it doesn't look like good news. These are homicides adjusted for population size. The US would probably have a higher homicide rate even without guns, but you can see how gun violence pushes that rate far beyond the other countries here. The victims of these shootings, they're not the ones you often see on the national news. They're disproportionately young black men. You guys can leave here and go on with your lives. We gotta go home to empty rooms because our children's lives were taken away by people who should not have had guns anyway. One possible explanation is that the U.S. simply has more crime than those other countries. But if you set aside homicides for a moment and look at rates of burglary or assault, you don't see that same spike that you see with homicide. It's not that America has much more crime. It's that crime in the U.S. is much more lethal. Altogether, the number of gun deaths in the U.S. from 2000 to 2013 exceeds the number of Americans killed by AIDS, by illegal drug overdoses, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and terrorism combined. It should be clear by now that this level of gun violence is a uniquely American problem among the developed world. And here's one reason why. There are a ton of guns in the U.S. This chart shows the estimated number of guns by country. It's adjusted for population size, and it's still not even close. The question that I would like to ask is, is, is how on earth could he compile 13 guns? H how can that happen? If you take a look back at the 10 countries with the highest levels of human development, you can see that it's relatively really easy to get a gun in the US. All of the other countries require a license to purchase most guns, and those purchases are recorded into an official registry. To get that license, people have to state a reason for why they want a gun. And in most of these countries, they have to pass a safety test and are required by law to store their guns safely. In part because of its lax laws, there are well over 300 million guns in the US and counting. This chart doesn't reflect private sales, but it shows the number of background checks, which all federally licensed dealers have to run. It suggests that the demand for guns has been increasing steeply since Barack Obama took office. So we've looked at gun deaths and at gun ownership. This chart puts them together. It shows that among highly developed countries, the more guns in a country, the more gun deaths. You can see that countries like Switzerland, which have relatively more guns than a country like the Netherlands, also have a higher gun death rate. And here's the US. Likewise, US states with more guns have more gun homicides. There are outliers like Idaho, which has higher rates of gun ownership, but low rates of gun murders. But overall, there's a correlation between gun ownership and homicide rates. And that relationship has held up in studies that control for things like poverty, unemployment, and crime. The correlation between gun ownership and gun deaths is even stronger for suicides. It makes sense. Depression with a gun is more dangerous than depression without one. Likewise, fights, domestic disputes, road rage, drunkenness, all much more dangerous with a gun than without. 
That said, you might need different policies to keep guns away from potential mass shooters than you would to keep them out of inner city gangs or out of the hands of someone who might hurt themselves. America doesn't have a gun problem. It has several of them. So as we saw in the video, the U.S. stands in stark contrast to other countries with much lower rates of, of gun deaths. And yet in the United States, the data available about guns, gun owners, and people's thoughts about guns are limited, unable to be viewed in real time, and often fail to capture the very local and very personal level on which gun deaths affect people's lives. So to that end, a solution that provides people with a publicly accessible real-time data on gun violence is a needed avenue to educate the public and engage them in a conversation about strategies to prevent gun violence. I'll turn it over to Evan to tell us about how the limited access to gun violence data has hampered our ability to create prevention. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about the current state of data in the gun violence debate and why better data is absolutely essential to informing uh, rational public policy. So where are we now? As it stands, there is a virtual prohibition on research conducted by the Centers for Disease Control into gun violence. Uh, this is because in 1996, Arkansas Representative Jay Dickey, himself a lifetime member of the NRA, submitted an amendment to an appropriations bill that eliminated the CDC's $2.6 million budget into gun violence research. The exact language of the bill stated that none of the funds made available in this title may be used in whole or in part to advocate or promote gun control. Just three years prior to this, uncoincidentally, uh, epidemiologist Arthur Kellerman published a paper which found that, among other things, uh, household gun ownership tripled the likelihood of being murdered and it significantly increased the likelihood of suicides and, and gun accidents. This research was funded by the CDC and so the NRA immediately began campaigning for the elimination of the specific center that funded uh, this research, the National Center for Injury Prevention. Uh, and while the NRA failed in this pursuit, what they did succeed in was passing this Dickey Amendment, uh, which Dr. Arthur Kellerman characterized in the following way. Precisely what was or what, what was not permitted under the clause was unclear, but no federal employee was willing to risk his or her career or agency's funding to find out. Extramural support for firearm injury prevention and research quickly dried up. 20 years later, very little has changed. Uh, as was recently reported in The Trace, the CDC still regards gun violence research as so off limits that it is not even listed in the table of contents of CDC's recently uh, listed research priorities. So we have an unfortunate situation in which we have uh, scholars of gun violence like Dr. Garen Wittenmute, an epidemiologist at UC Davis, who has had to spend $1 million of his own money in order to conduct research into the relationship between alcohol consumption and gun violence, uh, a question for which there's very limited existing data. Wittenmute estimates that there are fewer than five private foundations providing funding for gun violence research and only 12 scholars who, who research gun violence full time. And if you add together all the public sources of funding for gun violence research, you get about $2 million more annually in possible funding uh, for this research. So to put that number into context, the National Institutes of Health spent $21 million on research into headaches alone. That's $21 million on headaches versus $2 million into gun violence research. And we have a situation in which many young researchers cognizant of this fact, simply don't go into gun violence research because they know there are very limited opportunities for funding and there's very weak data. So the best available data on firearm deaths is the CDC's National Violent Death Reporting System, uh, which until recently only had data on 18 states, um, of which all of the states report it voluntarily, so there's pretty sizable gaps in the kind of data that you can get. Um, now, while the system was expanded to include 14 more states through a $7.5 million grant last year, uh, it will be years before enough data has been collected in order to make meaningful comparisons between the states. Um, and admittedly, while the quality of data is getting better, 
Uh, the U.S. still does not collect crucial information about important details such as the characteristics of a firearm causing an injury. We have no information on the number of guns in circulation or the types of guns that are routinely used in crime, who actually owns these guns, where people got these guns from. We have very limited data uh, that could be used to assess the effectiveness of laws like the effectiveness of background checks or safe storage laws and so on. Um, as Dr. Hemingway of the Harvard School of Public Health put it, we would like to be able to ask questions like, if you're a suburban white female, how likely are you to really die in homicide and suicide? And unfortunately, the data that we currently have just is not comprehensive enough to be able to answer this question. Now, at a recent Harvard forum on gun violence, Dr. David King at Indiana University gave the following illustrative exa example. He said that the data collected in emergency room visits in the United States is so extremely fine-grained on virtually anything that you could possibly care about except for gun violence. And it's so granular and fine-grained that you can find the exact number of people who punch holes in the walls at hospitals. And you can graph this by any kind of demographic that you might be interested in. And nobody is telling doctors not to collect information on who's punching holes at hospitals. Um, but when it comes to guns, people are saying, sorry, you just can't collect this data. We don't want you to tell us about this. And this is despite the fact, obviously, that the threat of widespread gun ownership, gun ownership is several orders of magnitude higher than um, punching holes in walls at hospitals. Um, now, compare how gun violence data is collected in the United States and compare that with how data is collected on automobile fatalities. So in the United States, when a car kills a person, virtually every detail that you could possibly care about goes into a government database called the Fatality Analysis Reporting System. It records weather conditions, driver behavior, vehicle characteristics, seatbelt use, drug use, everything. Uh, and the data is so granular, you can ask such specific questions like, what is the risk of an automobile fatality for a woman stopped at a stop so stoplight in the fog. And because of how specific and comprehensive the data we have on automobile fatalities is, it directly informs safety standards that are responsible for car deaths falling 27% since 1975. And thanks to this data, we have laws like drunk driver laws, mandatory seatbelt laws, minimum age drinking laws, motorcycle helmet laws, and so on. And because of this, now cars kill roughly the same number of people each year as guns. And, and so we know how useful this kind of data can be. And we know how useful it can be even in the context of gun violence. And to give one uh, illustrative example, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health uh, began collecting data on injuries caused by firearms and knives. And they collected this data from a variety of sources, including emergency room visits. Well, the system discovered um, a bunch of really interesting idiosyncrasies in, in, uh, in crime data and, and, and mortality data related to firearms and knives, including, for example, that there was a large number of hospital visits from children due to pellet gun injuries, and this led to legislation in Boston to curb those injuries. Um, then, in the mid-1990s, the so-called Boston miracle happened, in which we saw tremendous declines in gun violence. Um, and experts who have subsequently analyzed uh, the Boston Miracle, have attributed it to having data that allowed us to figure out uh, the type of individuals that were committing crimes and to create a regulatory system and an incentive system in order to deter that crime. And all of this would have been uh, impossible or impractical to implement without the database. So the message should be clear. We absolutely need better data on gun violence. And if we can't fix the politics, then we need to think of innovative ways to get data to bypass those politics. And Ben and John are here today to talk about a way to do just that. Great. Thanks a lot. And it's great to be here to tell you a little bit about the work that we're involved in in terms of taking new types of data streams to shed light on gun violence. As Evan said, there's a lack of data. But we can turn to new areas, new data sources to shed some important insights into violence and, and of course, the, the public's reaction to that violence and to policy issues. Let's take an example, which is the weather. So very easily, I can pull up my app on my iPhone, see what the weather is right now, where it is in any part of the world, and actually see what's going to happen in the future. And that's because, of course, NOAA makes data available to, via an API to apps and builds it and allows for an ecosystem of applications in the weather. So that's fantastic. 
So why doesn't that exist in public health? And that really is sort of what we have been working on for the last decade. And specifically, when it comes to gun violence, the issue is there is no public repository of data, there are no APIs to that information, and there's no way of actually analyzing and shedding light on that information and, and bringing it to bear to policy and to the general public. We're very interested in the issues of data availability and openness and transparency. And part of the issue is how data flows across all sectors in, in when it comes to public health. People might get sick or they might take surveys. Information flows to NGOs, to governments, to ministries of health. But what's problematic is if the data is there, it takes a long time to get to anybody that might want to know about it, and it may not actually be there in the first place. So our work has been really focused on this idea of online social data, data from news and chat rooms and blogs, sources where, that are not locked down by government entities. And so in this talk, I'll be telling you a little bit about our efforts in mining social media like Twitter, Google search data, which Ben will talk about, news sites, anything that we can get our hands on that actually reveals something that's happening at the ground level. And the, the real challenge there is to be able to organize that information. How do we begin to take that massive big data set and begin to organize it into ways that are actually useful in terms of understanding the conversation about gun violence? And once we've done that, we can actually begin to construct a surveillance source. So the idea is that if we have enough data coming from the ground, crowdsourced about events, about policy discussions, we can actually get early signals of what's happening. And not only that from a, te a temporal perspective, but from a geographic perspective, we know very clearly that we can get insights globally in real time across many parts of the world that have limited public health infrastructure or, of course, limited transparency. Um, this is not a new field. Um, we're applying a new field to gun violence. In fact, this idea of digital disease detection or digital epidemiology has been ongoing for the last decade. And it's been applied primarily in the infectious disease realm. Many examples exist specifically around influenza where mining social media and Google search data can provide insights into new epidemics as they unfold. Even the emergence of Ebola in West Africa was gleaned through the use of these new digital tools, integrating formal and informal sources that could actually track the spread of the emergence of Ebola across West Africa. And even more recently, if we look at Zika, these models have been able to predict the emergence, the introduction of Zika across Central and South America and its subsequent uh, expansion across the continents. So we're thinking about how to expand this concept of what we've now termed the digital phenotype, the idea of what we say and do online, what are, are, how we interact with technologies, that what we call digital exhaust can actually provide useful insights into public health issues. And so there are many different examples, but taking that sort of concept of information, we can get insights into chronic disease, we can get insights into drug safety. For instance, now that the FDA mines social media to get insights into new issues around drug side effects. We can actually provide hospitals with insights about patient experience, so issues around the quality of care. Um, we can even get insights into drug abuse and diversion, so uh, behaviors that might not ever come through traditional channels. So as you can see, we can actually get insights through these sources that may never have come through other, other possible ways. And of course, just generally disease surveillance. And at a high level, the real challenge of doing something like this is building new taxonomies. Trying to take the conversation about gun violence and, dis uh, and that happens online and begin to make it something useful requires the development of a new internet vernacular. So translating what people say online and the hashtags into something that makes sense. So when we worked, with, for instance, with the FDA, we had to take basically the different ways in which people spell uh, things online, uh, the variations, of course, in, in words, invented words and hashtags. So these are all different types of concepts and implied phrases that we have to then put together to basically organize that concept and then translate it to a taxonomy that makes sense from a regulatory perspective. And that this is just one example. So we're having to take that concept and apply it to this new domain. So, um, Basically, the idea here is thinking about the digital phenotype and thinking about whether we can take the massive amount of conversation that's happening online and begin to categorize it. And so we're expanding this concept by building, Ben and I are building this digital tool that essentially will provide shed light on uh, gun violence and the various discussions that take place. So the first step in doing that, of course, is building a data set. And so I'll tell you a bit, a bit about how we're building a full data stream of gun violence-related discussion then of course requires analysis, space and time analysis, and then eventually, and Ben's gonna talk about this, the building of the website itself. So I'll give you an example of why this data can be so useful. Um, there are challenges across many dimensions in terms of, of, of availability of data. For instance, gun uh, crime reporting. 
Well, we can go to city to city and ask police departments for data. That data may or may not be available. It's not necessarily available in real time, but we can go, for instance, to Twitter, where there are often, in the case of an event, hashtags around gunshots, or local news, which is very tuned to these issues. And mining that information can shed new light. Gun-related deaths, of course, CDC does publish some amount of data that can also be delayed, but you can once again go to, to news sites or you can go to actually obituaries, which I'll tell you about in a, in, a, in a few minutes. Gun ownership data, of course, we know that there's availability of background check information, but you can also go to, for instance, Google, where people are searching for terms like ammo or, or guns and actually get an indicator of the level of sales in a particular area. And of course then, just the general reaction to gun-related policies, that's not something that any official data set will have, but if you could turn to social media, you can get a sense of what the perspectives are at the population level. So I'll first tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing around Twitter, where we've been collecting data since last May to actually do continuous uh, extraction of information of mentions of gun-related topics, uh, filtering, processing, geocoding that information, and then doing state-level analysis. So we're using machine learning tools to basically categorize across a ver variety of buckets, of course, gun incidents reporting, but also discussions around gun policy, gun violence, and gun ownership. So this is a uh, map, just a, a one uh, snapshot in time just to get a sense of the geographic distribution of people tweeting about gun-related topics on a given day. Um, but then we can begin to organize that content. So across that uh, nine-month period that we've been analyzing, we have over 700,000 tweets that relate to gun-related topics. We can then begin to organize that by state and see what the various trends are across the country. As you can imagine, there's very specific topics that people talk about, uh, gun-related uh, violence being a big topic, but also policy issues. But that will vary across the, across the state. So for instance, in a gun-related instance, interestingly enough, Utah tends to be the ones to focus uh, on these types of, of topics, whereas policy, West Virginia comes out on top. Um, when we look at um, gun-related ownership tweets, Idaho, there's a big discussion that happens around the topics around people owning their, their guns. Um, but then when it comes to general uh, violence-related discussions, uh, Delaware. So we can look at these geographic distribution uh, uh, changes across these different topics, but we can also look at them over time. As you can imagine, various events that happen um, will change the discussion. So of course, San Bernardino will have a major impact on the discussion and the various topics that people will talk about. Um, for instance, in Massachusetts, of course, that led to a big amount of discussion. Um, we also had a mass shooting at University of Massachusetts. Once that took place, we could actually collect tweets that were, were people at the scene or describing the events that were unfolding. We can look at that comparatively to Michigan, where, of course, once again, huge discussion around San Bernardino, but recently around Kalamazoo, actually most of the discussion is really around policy topics, not necessarily about uh, first-hand accounting of the events. Okay, so then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with news media. News media and local news specifically turns out to be an incredible resource if we know how to mine it and harness that information. So since last year, we've been collecting a huge amount of data to continuously organize and classify this information and once again do state-level analysis of around different types of news-related content. The way that we do this is harnessing actually a platform that we've developed, healthmap.org, to basically mine hundreds of thousands of websites every hour across 15 languages where we're constantly extracting text from news sites and doing this every hour. And essentially, uh, using machine learning tools, once again, being able to characterize the types of articles that are coming through in a, in a, in a six-way classification. So just to sort of animate this in a little way, we have articles coming through from different types, whether it's breaking news of a gun-related crime, um, warnings of events that are emerging, policy discussions, um, and potentially some noise, so not gun-related NGR here. But if we were very interested in just specifically in events that were unfolding or warnings of events that were about to take place, we get about 1,000 new alerts across the U.S. Um, every month so far, uh, precisely placed across 40,000 locations. And this is just a visualization of that data. Once again, a snapshot of the last couple weeks of events of gun-related. Um, crimes that have taken place, and you can basically interact with this data and, and see this information across different, sort, uh, different locations. Um, if you wanted to see sort of how the news is reflecting, slightly different than, for instance, on Twitter, where policy rep represents such a big topic, the gun-related incidents actually represent a huge part of what the news is reporting on, not surprisingly. In extension of this effort, working with my colleagues at Epidemico, we've been able to actually begin to mine obituary data. So this is hundreds of local news sites that actually report obituaries on a daily basis. 
using the information, we can actually extract gun-related uh, fatalities and begin to classify that information by age, by gender, by location. And in real time now, we actually have a new data source of gun-related fatalities. Of course, that doesn't represent all of them, but it represents actually a new data source that we can begin to map and look at gender differences. Of course, as we know, huge uh, overrepresentation of males, uh, and in this case, younger males, but then we can look at these trends uh, over time. So of course, this is just all very early days in utilizing this data, but there's a huge opportunity to begin to harness these, uh, these types of information streams. Um, what we know, and so I'll just a little bit to close out, of course, huge benefits in thinking about these type of data in gun violence and broadly in public health, massive amount of information coming through these channels that really represents a whole new uh, stream of intelligence that we can begin to collect um, that really represents parts of the population that we would never have access to otherwise. And so, of course, very worth, um, worth looking at despite, of course, a number of challenges in thinking about these data. Accessing, of course, we were lucky enough to have access to specific feeds of data from, for instance, Twitter. The access to these types of data streams can change. The storage and ability to use this data can be extraordinarily expensive. And in fact, really, this is a very new science of using these types of digital sources. So we really do need a lot more methods and a lot more research into how to properly utilize these types of information streams. I don't have to tell this group, of course, eth ethical challenges in using this data, very clear. And really the goal here is not to try to create a new data, data stream of using um, this in, in, in a bubble. It's about trying to integrate with other data sources. And so developing methods to take this data, integrate it with more official sources is sort of the, the, the end goal. So I'll leave it there. Thank the team uh, in Boston for all their help building all these tools. And um, I'm turn it over to my colleague, Ben. Great, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So. Uh, John just described kind of the broader field, uh, this emerging digital phenotype, using all these non-traditional emerging data sources to try to tap into what's going on in public health. Um, we heard from the other speakers about the importance of bringing data to the conversation um, and really engaging the public around uh, gun violence and the related issues. So what I'm about to talk on behalf of the entire team here um, is show you the product that we're building, show you this public-facing resource uh, that brings everything you've heard here uh, together. So just to kind of quickly tell you where we are. Uh, so the problem, as Jessica mentioned in the beginning, um, is that many members of the public are not sufficiently informed on matters relating to gun violence or gun ownership or gun policy in their local uh, areas. And when people aren't informed, uh, they care less. They're engaged less in the conversation. Um, policies are made without public engagement or sufficient public engagement. And these policies affect people's lives. Uh, so the question is, how do we solve this problem? Uh, one approach, which we've taken in, in this uh, project, is to try to engage people by informing them. Uh, try to connect people with data and information that matters to them. Uh, right? Think globally, act locally. Uh, we believe in inform locally, act locally, and also uh, be aware of what's going on around you. Um, so we believe that by creating an intuitive resource that engages people around matters that are happening around the block for them on their street, uh, we might be able to maybe form a touch point uh, that, around which people can coalesce their interest and engagement around these important issues. So the goal is to engage members of the public with this interactive resource um, by giving them real-time information um, around all these issues. Uh, we also have a secondary goal, which, is to, which you won't see today, but which is kind of in our broader vision, uh, which is to create a, a goal for policymakers and people who are interested in uh, gun-related policies uh, to track things over time. Uh, understand the effects of certain policies on certain data sources. Uh, so let's see what that looks like. Well, we basically have three goals here, and then we're going to get to the, the nice pictures and the demo. Uh, the three goals are to collect real-time data on gun violence, gun policies, and gun sales uh, from traditional and non-traditional sources, uh, to provide the public with common sense views of that data, uh, and it's to identify trends and generate forecasts to interpret current data um, on gun sales and gun violence. So. You've seen uh, in the previous slides uh, what some of these traditional sources are, uh, what some of the traditional uh, or non-traditional data sources are. Uh, the ones of interest here would be the Google News, right, seeing uh, mining these online news sources, uh, Twitter, which you'll see a bit more of, and search queries, what people are searching for online. Uh, there's a lot of challenges when looking at, this, at these things. Uh, one of them is these are very different types of data, and to try to integrate them all into one uniform 
interface or presentation is very difficult for people to get their minds around. Um, these data are updated at different rates, so some of these things might be you know, more traditional data sources might be updated once a year with a delay of a year. Uh, some of the more uh, non-traditional data sources, the emerging ones, are updated every few minutes or in real time. And so how do you kind of bring that together? Um, you also have differing levels of reliability, right? Obviously, Twitter is kind of an open uh, jungle of information, which we're all aware of how, uh, how diverse the kinds of things uh, that can be posted on Twitter are, uh, some of them being posted right now as we speak. Um, and so really taming that beast and trying to get something useful out of it is a very big challenge. Um, and we're now, we've made, and over the past few years in general and over the past year on this project, uh, have made some important progress in that field. So let's look at some of this data and I'll show you the website. Um, I'll just focus in for the next few slides on Google searches. So before we start looking at this data, it's very important to understand that this data is available to everyone. It's called Google Trends and you, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It is very anonymized. It's very de-identified. In fact, uh, if uh, you ask Google Trends a question, uh, that kind of hyper-focuses the query to tell me how many people search for this search term over this time period in this location. And Google says, you know what? So few people searched for that term in that space and in that time, I'm not going to tell you the answer because that's already approaching uh, non-anonymity. So this is very, very, very broad population level data uh, that you can in no way bring back to individual searches. Important to say that before we move on. So now that we know that this is population level data, let's look at what it tells us. Well. There's this thing called background checks, which you all know about. Uh, it basically, if you buy, if you try, attempt to purchase a firearm through a formal channel in the United States, um, according to the law, you need to undergo a criminal background check to make sure you don't have a criminal record that would make you a person who society feels is unsafe for you to own this gun. Um, so the FBI actually has a system, a computerized national system, for recording when these background checks are uh, requested. And monthly data comes out uh, for each state with some, some degree of delay about how many background checks were done in each month in each state. Uh, and for lack of a better option, as we heard here from the other speakers, uh, this has turned out to be the go-to data source, right? So even though it's very much a proxy, but it only, it only covers some uh, gun sales, this has become uh, the standard data source for people trying to track gun sales, looking at the background check data, even though it's very incomplete. Well, we said, all right, given that's our gold standard or silver standard, let's see how well Google search, uh, search trend data compares to that. So we looked simply uh, for Google searches for the word gun uh, across all 50 states. Each dot here is a state. Um, and we compared that to the background checks per 100,000 residents uh, for those states. And you see a very nice kind of linear uh, diagonal curve here, very strong correlation. Uh, the difference is obviously that the Google data is free, instantaneous, and much higher resolution. So it correlates over space. How about over time? Well, we looked across the entire nation over the course of an entire year, um, and we looked at the background checks every month, and we looked at the searches this time for the word, uh, again, for the word gun, and we see that those data streams also correlate very nicely over time. So we have a very nice correlation over space, very nice correlation over time uh, between these two data sources. Okay, what if we try to connect it to another data source, namely gun deaths, right? So these would be considered in the outcome category, right? Gun-related um, deaths. Uh, so if you compare that to the number of people searching for ammo in each state, right? Each dot here is a state. Uh, the uh, y-axis is the number of people uh, uh, per 100,000, uh, the number of firearm deaths per 100,000, and the x-axis is the number of searches for the word ammo. And again, you see a very tight correlation. Now, again, I have to emphasize, these data are free, instantaneously available, and available with uh, geographic and temporal res resolution. Finally, we also looked at policy data. Um, so here you see a, uh, a general data source that kind of summarizes how restrictive gun policies are in different states. And you see that the more restrictive, at least according to this graph, the more restrictive uh, the gun policies are in a given state, in other words, the further uh, to the right you are, um, the fewer uh, searches there are for the word pistol. And again, we just keep varying up, uh, switching up the, the Google search term we're looking at. Okay, so this is just a deep dive into one of the data sources. Let's get to the, uh, to the actual uh, website. So here are the challenges we faced when creating this website um, before you actually see the, the uh, demo. Um, there's a lot of information 
uh, that you can glean from these non-traditional data sources alongside the traditional data sources about gun-related uh, violence, gun ownership, and other related issues. And presenting that to members of the public who are not only uninformed but unengaged can be a very big information challenge, right? People think, well, this is way too much information. Why should I even care about it, let alone try to understand it? Um, there's a lot of unfamiliar terms and concepts, and so the question is, how do you create that initial touch point? How do you create an initial connection with a, un an, a let's say, typical member of the public who may not be fully informed about these issues and make them care? Uh, so with that, we're gonna show you uh, a website which we have in development. Let's bring it up here. Is that coming up? Great. Um, so this is the website. It's not yet available, but you guys get to see it here, a world premiere. Um, it's going to be coming soon to a web browser near you. Um, and we're going to tell you how to sign up for notifications if you want to be informed when the website comes out. All right, so this is uh, gun violence. How does your state compare? It's still showing that. It's still showing that? Okay, let's see if we can uh, hit escape maybe. Okay. And then is there a way to maybe show this screen on <laughs> on the presentation. Okay. Do we have an AV person? Do you function up there? You want to show us? We want we want to project this uh, this web browser up on the screen. There's no way to do it, right? No, if you don't. Right. Yeah, we can. Do, we have a slide back up. Yeah, there's a screenshot somewhere. Okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Having some technical difficulties, please hold. That's where it's me. Okay. Okay. We might take a moment to take a couple of questions while we get the website loaded, because now it seems as though PowerPoint is also frozen. So there is a mic in the middle of the room, and we'll take a couple of questions while we work on getting this up. Hi, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, as a researcher, you, you, you have focused so much on trying to educate the public and getting information, hopefully with the goal of changing public opinion one way or another. Um, However, there's a, there's a recent study that just came out of Princeton University that's shown that over the last 50 years, public opinion of the bottom 90% of Americans has a non-statistical significant impact on policy. In fact, zero impact on policy when you look back over the 50 years. Uh, what does have an impact is the public opinion of the top 10% of Americans. And so what, uh, my question for you is, like, what are you trying to accomplish by informing the majority of Americans? Should, wouldn't a more strategic method be trying to engage that top 10% who does have influence based on research on policy? around firearm violence is accessible to just those who are researchers, just those who sort of have access to data points. So we want to broaden that group of people, and I think that we'll also engage policymakers, those in that top 10% through this process as well. I don't know if any of you want to contribute. I, I just wanted to mention that it is, it's not as if the top 10% uh, of people in terms of political influence, in terms of educational status, it's not as if they're not receptive to evidence. Uh, as I touched on in my speech, a lot of the most important questions related to what 
can we actually do in order to curb gun violence? Uh, in, a lot of those questions we currently just can't answer sufficiently because of the lack of limited data. So one thing that I'm optimistic about is that we can actually dig into this real-time data in order to establish the effects of things like background checks or safe storage laws. And then once we can actually credibly establish that these policies are effective, hopefully that, um, that will inform uh, you know, the top 10% who I I'm sure are receptive to uh, to better data and, and, you know, more credibly evaluating these policies. So we'll pause the questions just so that Ben can go through the demo of the website and then we'll go back to questions as soon as you guys get to see the website. We're now doing our talk already in progress. <laughs> All right, so uh, back to our demo. Um, so here's, here's what it looks like uh, for someone logging in. The first question the person is confronted is with, how does your state compare? Right? A lot of people know that they might think that there's a lot of uh, gun activity or gun violence or gun policy discussions in their area compared to the rest of the state, but compared to the rest of uh, the country. But is that true? So the first screen we bring up is essentially a kind of high level view. I'll walk you through the different types of uh, data that are presented here. The first one is the latest gun violence news. Notice the website is automatically detected that we're logging in from Austin, Texas. Um, and so here we see a number of curated stories um, all very recent, um, having to do with guns, gun violence, gun incidents uh, from our area. Um, and you see that they've been categorized uh, either as something to do with uh, law enforcement coming in uh, around a shooting or a gun crime with law enforcement coming in. Um, I'll scroll down a bit, you guys can see. Uh, we actually have a team curating these data, uh, semi-automated, and you can see that there's actually um, some data around it. Are there any dead, any injured uh, from each of these stories? And obviously if you click on any one of these, uh, you can be taken to the actual news story. So it's almost a gun-related cut of the news universe, um, specific to your place, specific to your time. And that's a great way to start the engagement because people say, wow, I didn't know there were all these shootings in my area. Um, and you can get a, a nice categorization uh, of those. Uh, moving into the next category here, uh, we talk about state rankings. And obviously this can be expanded into many, many more sources of data. Um, the first one we talk about is the death rate. Uh, all the bars here point in one direction, which means that the bigger the bar, right, the more a gun activity or the more danger is, uh, there is, et cetera. So here we see that Texas is actually ranked 19 out of 50 um, as far as death rate per 100,000 people um, due to guns or firearm injury. Uh, so here it's 10.5 deaths, uh, meaning there are 18 states that have lower gun death rates, um, and the, uh, the rest of the states, uh, 20, 31 of them, um, have higher gun death rates. Uh, there's also something called a gun law rank, um, and this one is 33rd out of 50, which means that 32 states have more restrictive gun policies, and uh, 17 states uh, have uh, less restrictive gun policies. Um, and we, we point to a certain uh, gun, grade, gun policy grading system uh, that's uh, a third party uh, objective source. And uh, background checks, which again is the go-to data source that a lot of people use. Um, and we can see that Texas is number 31 in the nation uh, for background checks. So this is all very interesting data. Uh, we're combining kind of more traditional data with some non-traditional data. Uh, but here's where it gets interesting. So you scroll down here, you actually see what people are saying in your area on Twitter related to guns and gun violence. So you can see here's the Austin metropolitan area. You see recent geotag tweets relating to guns uh, been categor being categorized into various categories. So I'll scroll down a bit more. So first, let's hover over them so we can see what these tweets are. So up over here, uh, police, nine dead after, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here we go. Uh, gun control equals conspiracy. Uh, Cruz really hitting on Trump, right? Something to do with uh, the political campaign. Uh, you can see the usual stuff that comes on uh, over the Twitter uh, feed. Um, so here we go, um, maybe something a bit more relevant. Um, gun control, she was shot in the back by her four-year-old, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly someone's talking specifically about a, uh, apparently a very tragic uh, case that happened here, slightly east of Austin. Um, so what we've done is we've actually summarize this information um, to understand what is the Austin gun control, or sorry, gun policy, gun violence, uh, gun-related um, ownership conversation. What does that look like? 
And so we see that, as you saw in John's presentation, there was a nice breakdown uh, by type of uh, tweet. Uh, you see about one-third of all the tweets here relate to a specific gun incident. About half of them relate to gun policies in general. And we have smaller categories here about gun ownerships or sale. Here you can actually see the individual tweets. Um, again, they are categorized by a specific category here, most of them, again, being either a gun incident of a specific shooting um, or um, a general discussion of gun policy. Now, when we've shown this to people on the street, as it were, uh, this part actually grabs their attention the most, uh, the, news, the live news feed um, and the Twitter conversation. And the reason is that this is public conversation. It's going on out there. It's out in the Twitterverse. But because the Twitterverse is so broad and so open, uh, creating this curated cut of the Twitterverse that is almost a refraction through a prism of gun violence and gun-related uh, issues allows people to see something they've never seen before, which is what are my neighbors talking about? What is my city talking about? What is my state talking about? And this turns out to engage people pretty well because they say, wow, I'm now part of that conversation. I didn't know so many people were engaged about it in my area. I can see why that is. Maybe I'll lend my voice to whatever side of the debate uh, or sides of the debate uh, that I feel strongly about. Um, there's one more section here uh, that I'll scroll down to, um, which is kind of a more standard national map view. Um, and here you can select different cuts at the data, right? Talking about gun deaths, background checks, certain gun policies, um, and you get a nice shaded map uh, with, if you keep scrolling down, um, a nice kind of bar graph below it. Um, and this is kind of the beginning of our policy uh, cut for people who are interested in the numbers, interested in comparing the different states. Now, there's a lot more coming on this website. Um, we see, uh, first of all, the Google Trends data, which hasn't been integrated here, a lot, uh, some more traditional data sources like the uh, Violent Death Reporting System, uh, the Unified Crime Reporting uh, data is going to be integrated into here. Uh, so that's on the data side. But we also see uh, some more features coming out here. Um, and namely, those features are some sort of alerts. Uh, do you, guys, you guys know what Google Alerts are, right? You want Google to notify you anytime something of interest happens. Well, maybe you're interested if there's a shooting in your neighborhood. Maybe you're interested if a certain politician says something. Maybe you're interested um, if there's a certain policy development in your area. Um, those kind of alerts can, will be able to be set up uh, in the system so people can remain engaged in the ways that they care about most. Um, I'll revert back. Hopefully this is going to work. Let's see. Reverting back to the PowerPoint while that's opening, <laughs> or not. Um, she'll come back. Um, I'll say one more thing about the website, uh, which is that we're going to be launching this in the coming months. Um, and we're going to give you, in the next minute or so, um, a link that you can use uh, to sign up for uh, notifications. Um, so that when, when the site goes live, uh, you guys will be able to see that. So I think best to maybe shift over to back to the questions now yeah. and we'll... Yeah, so we'd love to open it up to your questions. We'll also all be up here because I know we only have about five minutes for questions. So we're going to stick around so we can continue this conversation and get you any information that you're interested about the website afterwards. Okay, yep. guys, uh, thank you very much. This is the best session that I've attended in the last three, uh, three days. Thank you. You exactly know what you're talking about. There is no buzzword, it's plain human talk. Uh, I've been working in this area for the last nine years. Uh, so the question I have is the uh, number one in the own accuracy that you says that 1,000 predictions in 40,000 locations. How you manage the false alarms? Uh, you know uh, how many people you know if you do if you're going to tell that there is a shooting in Austin, Texas tomorrow, people will go go in panic and there is no uh, no shooting. Second problem comes with these spurious correlations. So I can mathematically prove every time there is a premiere for Batman movie, 300 people die on that weekend in America. So you can connect everything with everything with this world of big data. Nothing is random. And, and, the, and the last question I, I have is the, because I've been working in this area, tweets are so temporary, and it's the past. People talk about past. So while people are talking about the San Bernardino's attack and this attack and that attack, the people who are trying to do those things are not tweeting anything. Hey, I'm a mass shooter. I just bought a gun, and I'm thinking to do something with about, with, uh, about it. So we are not getting those tweets of the actual persons. So when it comes to prediction, I can totally understand the information portal part and the policy part. But when it comes to prediction, I'm not sure how far we can go. I'll give that okay. to you guys. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there was a lot. That was a lot of questions. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, it's, it, so. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, absolutely. The question of false alarms is something that we've struggled with, you know, since the inception of these concepts. And outbreak detection is the same idea. Might get a false alarm in an event. I mean, this comes through a variety of different ways. Of course, we have our we have actual humans that are curating data, so we don't just have a fully automated system. So we have ways of curating the data and actually feeding that back to our machine learning algorithms to, extra, to, to remove noise so our system improves over time, but we still have that human element that's, that's always there. So that's a big part of, of what we do. The other aspect is integration of sources. So depending on the quality of the source, say it's a, it's a new, new, um, newspaper that's highly you know, respected, that might raise the value of that information source versus maybe a tweet where you might, ha might have to have multiple corroborating evidence of an event before you actually would expose it a, as an alert. So these are the kind of things that we've been working on and for, the, for years. This is the kind of tools that we'll apply to this kind of data. I'll turn it over to Ben on the predictive side. Yeah, so I'll just briefly say, because we want to get to the other uh, questioners here, and I'm happy to talk to you kind of offline afterwards. But um, on the correlation side, there is a lot of noise and a lot of signal, actually. Um, and we've done a lot of the work to kind of curate these data sources and understand how to get the signal and reduce the noise. Uh, still a lot more work to do. I will say that contextualizing things over space and over time allows you to correct for a lot of those aberrations. Um, a lot more to say. I'll, I'm happy to talk to you about it offline. Let's get to the other uh, questioners. Hi, I think your website and project are, is really exciting. Um, my question is also about the predictive component, and that is what is the use case or goal for the predictive element? Because I understand the website, it's more of um, this is what's happening in, in your area, this is how it compares to other states. Um, but how would people or, I don't know, uh, the government use a predictive analytic tool like this to say when events are coming? So good question. Um, so there's kind of two use cases there. The first one is uh, for generalized uh, contextualization of the information. If I told you today that um, uh, this month there were uh, 10 uh, homicides per 100,000 people, is that a lot, is that a little, is that a lot compared to other states? Right? So in order to contextualize that against your own uh, history, your own regional history, uh, what we do is we develop these kind of seasonal models based on years of data going back. And we can tell that usually December there are, you know, in the Chicago area in December there are usually X or Y, um, you know, deaths related to gun violence. Um, and, the, you know, the, district, the range is usually between X and Y, and now you see that we're above that range, right? So that's one reason why we would create these predictive models is to, in real time, interpret uh, is there an unusual rise. Um, the second one is to generally map uh, emerging trends. Uh, so oftentimes you can tell, you know, we, we all see it in the poll numbers, right, when everybody's following the presidential election, you can tell, well, even though candidate A is still beating candidate B, it's not looking good for candidate A because candidate B has been rising five points in the poll every day and soon will catch up. Um, and so the predictive models are very much around there uh, to understand where things are going. Uh, and a lot of times these uh, kind of uh, current alarms aren't triggered, right? You haven't gotten into this uh, extreme state yet. Uh, but it's definitely trending there. And that's where uh, the red lights can turn on and you can say, okay, this is an unusual phenomenon. Maybe this should be addressed in a public forum. But I guess, so it's more to raise the consumer's awareness like, and make them more um, aware of the gun violence issue than to have like police or some kind of authority say, oh, this looks like a potential hotspot. Right, we, okay. we, <laughs> we see this as a general uh, public utility and okay. whoever wants to use it as they wish uh, will do so, uh, but we're very much positioning it for public engagement first and foremost. Okay, um, thank you. Sure. Hi, thank you for an uh, excellent talk. Um, you pretty much answered all of my questions, but I have one. Um, will this be open source? Can we contribute? Yeah, I mean, so absolutely. So the idea is I mean, we're gonna try to figure out how to make this data available, but of course it's gonna be a public website. We'll make an API available. We're open to any you know, other forms of data collaboration. So please get in touch with us because you know, the more groups that are involved in working on this data, the better. So our plan is to, to make this available and collaborate you know, freely. Hi there. Um, I work a lot with social data, uh, mostly for brands, so this is a little more impactful. Um, <laughs> but I'm very familiar with the setup, and I just was wondering from a, again, predictive standpoint, what would be, obviously it looks like there's some things in the pipeline that you're looking to sort of develop and, and release. 
what would be sort of an ideal correlation uh, if you could have it your way, whether it's between tweets or news and, and something else that would really move forward your predictive abilities? Briefly, maybe I'll answer that very briefly and maybe hand it, hand it over to the other speakers. Um, one of the great use cases that we've already started looking at are policy changes. As you know, gun policies are very much an evolving and dynamic field in different states and sometimes even municipalities. Um, and the question is, how do these uh, tectonic shifts that go on, you know, effective January 1st, there will be open carry in such and such a place. Effective 2017, there will be, um, you know, a, a, an extra level of check uh, registration required around certain gun purchases. How does that affect gun sales? How does that affect gun violence? How does that affect uh, the discussion? Using the traditional data sources, that might take years to answer. Using the non-traditional data sources, you can, get, you can get your finger on the pulse within days and weeks. I mean, I'll just put, put an analogy to what we were dealing with 10 years ago, trying to do this for outbreaks. So the idea of putting this kind of data on a map and having the public see it, you know, may, created such panic for governments. How could you let people know about disease events that are happening? You know, that's gonna create panic. It didn't create panic, it just created, you know, information for people to be just more intelligent about what's happening around them. So all of a sudden, you know, ten, now fast forward 10 years, now governments are making their data available on outbreaks. It's not as scary to think about unlocking data. So this is partly also a hope, you know, putting out this data might, might sort of, you know, catalyze other types of data streams to be more available. So I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. So we will stay up here for people who have other questions and we can be happy to answer those. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate Thank having you here.